this talk and welcome John Danes to give it. One of the reasons is that I wouldn't be in computing at all if it wasn't for the Leo, because as a young engineer working on the Victoria line in London Transport, uh, we did some uh, a, a project for the Institution of Mechanical Engineers about the combination of economic factors in designing urban railways, which was a complex topic between things like the rolling stock, fuel consumption, acceleration rates on trains and huge investment in fixed assets like number of terminal platforms you need and goodness knows what. So we did this big study and all the case, cases went through that machine so we could come out with some conclusions. So I'm very grateful and I'd love to hear more about the history and you don't want to hear my history. So I welcome John and we're looking very, forward very much to his talk. John, it's over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm John Danes. I joined Leo Computers 59 years ago uh, in October 1961. It was the, I left from school. It was the only job that didn't want a degree. Um, but I wanted to go there. I, in 1959, our physics master, Mr. Nelcon, took us to Cambridge for a day. And in the morning we saw the, uh, the telescope. And in the afternoon we saw EDSAC. And uh, I hadn't forgotten that. So I went along for an interview as an operator on the Leo 2 Bureau in Hartree House. And I stayed with that company. I, I worked on Leo 2 and then Leo 3 in the factory and stayed with the company until I left ICL in March 2002. So what I want to talk about today is, is how Leo came about. Um, as it said, it was the world's first business computer. Um, not the world's first commercially sold computer, but the first one that was used for business. So we'll look at the business background and why, why it got built in the first place. Um, what some of the, the early wins were, some of the lessons that were learned, how it got developed, and, and then at the end, we'll see what, what was left. The L for Leo stands for Lions, and, and Lions were a, a massive catering company that was started in the 19th century um, by, by some business people who act, actually ran. A, John, we've in, lost your sound. Have you? We, I've still. Got I'm still hearing it. I'm still hearing it. Me. Same here. Sound okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, they, they had an enormous chain of tobacconists and, and made cigars, and they decided, having been to exhibitions, that there was a, a lack of decent catering for big events. So they, they started off doing catering and grew from that and then opened tea shops um, on the basis that it would be a good idea to have standard high quality food for people to buy at reasonable prices. And they were quite well branded. If, if you look here, the J Lions was picked out in gold and all the waitresses were known as nippies. Um, but they then had much, much bigger restaurants as well. The corner houses, there, there's some stuff there about the size of them. In, enormous levels of activity. Um, and as you can see at the, the Empire Exhibition, thousands and thousands of people going there and enormous numbers of meals served. And then they grew, um, they had the, the, the Trocadero restaurant, which was really before my time. And I only ever remember hearing about it as a building site just near Piccadilly Circus, but it had been the, the most enormous restaurant in Europe and all, all the, the rich and famous went there. And they opened hotels, so hotels you've probably heard of, the, the Cumberland on the corner of Oxford Street and, and uh, Edgware Road, um, and the Strand Palace and Regent Palace hotels. 
So they were doing a lot of catering. And as, as they grew, they then started, they were making food and they had two big sites. One was at Cadby Hall, um, which a lot of that's been knocked down now, but it was next to Olympia on, on Hammersmith Road. And then the enormous factory at Greenford. And, and between the wars, that they, they were employ, employing about 30,000 people. And north of Greenford at Sudbury, they had what a lot of companies had um, at that time, an enormous sports facility for, for the staff with all, all the sports that you could think of really. Um, and they again, very, very strong brands. They were not only running the tea shops, but they were distributing. And, and a lot of the people here today are of the generation that will remember these products. One of the important things was that, that they were what we would call a vertically integrated company in that they, for example, they built all their own vehicles. They had a company called Norman, so they would buy a chassis and, and build all the bodies onto it and maintain all, all the vehicles as well. Um, the laundries, you can imagine the amount of laundry that there was in, in hotels. They had a big printing company for leaflets, documents, packaging and so on, building services. So they were used to running businesses that, that weren't the, the core food businesses. Running an enterprise of this size was enormous and they just had millions and millions of transactions with very, very low margins. And trying to keep control of this was an enormous task. But they, they were a far-sighted company and in, in the 1920s, they recruited John Simmons, who came, came from Cambridge and he, he set up something called the Business Research Center, which became the, the Systems Research Office. And that they were doing what we would call O&M today, look, looking at business process. And Simmons um, was actually quite central to this work within the country um, as, as, as a recognized leader. And they, they centralized and organized their clerical functions and they started to do things like exception reporting for managers um, rather than just churning lots of paper. They were early users of, of microfilm, for example, so they, they had been prepared to use technology. Af after the war, Simmons had two people, T.R. Thompson and, and Standingford, who, who were Cambridge graduates, and he'd heard that there were things called computers and sent them to the States to find, about, find out about what was going on. They, they had quite a difficult time because a lot of the stuff the Americans said was, was secret and most of what they found was it was being used for military and scientific work, calculating range tables and so on. But they did talk to a, a gentleman called Goldstein in, in America who told them about what was going on back home in, in Britain um, and told them about Hartree and Wilkes at Cambridge who, who were building the EDSAC. So when they got home, and, and I think while they were away and on the journey, they, Thompson and Standingford had a, had a chance to, to think and they started thinking about how computers might be used for, for office work like payroll and, and that sort of thing. So when they came back, they, they went to visit Wilkes and Hartree in Cambridge University and produced a, a report. So that, that was between May and September. So they've been to the States, they've been to Cambridge, they produced a report, took it to the Lions board, and in October, Lyons agreed that they would go ahead with, with building one of these new computers. And the way they did it was that they would, they gave Cambridge University 3000 pounds, which was a considerable sum of money in those days to help them uh, complete the machine. 
and a gentleman called Ernest Lennart, who worked for Lyons and, and was uh, knew about electrical stuff, was loaned to, to Cambridge for two years to assess, assist with the, the completion of EDSAC. And in November, Cambridge University agreed the deal. So if, if you look at that time scale to, uh, and for such a momentous decision, Lions could move quickly if they wanted to. As I mentioned, Lions had been doing work out, outside the catering side. An example was that, that during the war, when large amounts of ammunition and bombs and so on were required, the government needed factories set up to run these um, because they, they didn't have a, an internal government mechanism. So they commissioned factories from different companies and Lyons was asked to construct and operate a factory at, at just near Bedford. And th this was pretty large. You can see some of the figures there about the amount of bombs and stuff that they um, produced. And Lyons were complimented at the end of the war because it was seen having been a very uh, effective factory. So there, there they are using their skills outside their food expertise. And while EDSEC was progressing, Lyons had uh, been working hard. And in 1949, when EDSAC was completed and ran its first job, Lyons recruited John Pinkerton, who'd, who'd been at Cambridge, who'd worked on radio, radar, and was known to Wilkes. And he, his job really was the, the agreement with Lyons and the university was that, that Lyons would be able to use the the IPR and, and, and what had been learned on EDSAC and that they would then develop it. And this, this, this was done during the two years from 49 to 51. And in 1951, Leo ran the first, the first commercial job in the world on bakery valuations, look, looking at the um, costs and so on of, of a week's bakery. Now, what, uh, what they'd had to do um, was to take a machine that at Cambridge had, I think, paper tape input with small amounts of paper data going in, and the output would be on a teleprinter, so relatively small amounts of output, but doing large amounts of calculations. Now, what, what Lyons needed to do was to read in vast amounts of data, I mean, potentially 30,000 payroll records each week um, and produce vast amounts of, of data, carry forward records and pay slips and so on. So they, the whole scale of the thing was different. Uh, let's just have a look. So this is, this is Leo 1 as it was built with, with various pictures. Um, you can see the, the enormous size of it. One of the things they needed to do was, was that um, in those days, money was, was sterling. So there were pound, shillings and pence. So there, there was a requirement to, to operate in pound, shillings and pence and, and decimal, whereas a lot of the scientific work would, would be done in binary. So a lot, a lot of what needed to be done in, in terms of, of hardware, I've mentioned some of that. Pro, programming had never really been done on such scale and, and uh, complexity. Job, jobs had to be analyzed. And the way that, that Lyons went about it was not just to computerize what had been done, but was to look at how the new technology could be used um, to, be, to become more effective. And a lot of work, this, this was essentially div, driven by David Kaminer, um, who'd, who'd been in the systems research office. Um, we'll talk about this a bit more in a minute. Um, it, it required being operated. If, if you have a small machine with a, with a paper tape reader and, and a teletype, um, 
it, it probably hasn't got the, the extensive offline and data control requirements uh, of, of a commercial operation. And then the machine needs to be maintained for reliable use. The, these, these weren't jobs that would last five or 10 minutes. There were jobs that could potentially last, last for hours. So there was a, a great requirement to increase the reliability of the equipment. So the, the people doing the, the key people on design, there was Pinkerton, Lennertz, who, who'd spent two years at Cambridge, Ray Shaw, who, who was recruited having worked on radar in the war. He's, he's still about, he's 96 now, and Ernest Kay. Um, all, all those are dead apart from Ray Shaw. So we, we, we've discussed the, the need to use decimal and binary stuff. One of, the, one of the things that was required was, was to match the slow peripherals to, to the relatively high speed of the processor. So they, they did work and introduced hardware buffers so that um, if, if, if there were a pack of cards uh, in a card reader, it would automatically feed one into a hardware buffer so that the, when the computer read it, it, it was already there, it didn't have to start the, the card reader up. And similarly with printers, it, it would put the line of print into a hardware buffer and the printer could then empty it. What, what this meant was that you could be re reading a card for the next man while you were processing this one and printing the previous one. The um, very small memory it was mercury delay lines as you can see 2048 short words of 17 bits there was no backing store um no alphabetic codes it was all all numeric at that stage um but think thinking about things like maintenance they decided that it should be built on a modular basis so they've got standard sized racks and units that, that could be taken out and tested or plugged in again. And an enormous problem with valves, five or 6,000 valves. Um, one of the things they did a lot of work on was marginal voltage. So they, they could run a test program to test, test the machine and then ver vary the margin, the, the voltage is higher or lower so that they could see which valves were likely to, to fail. And, also producing documentation. Um, obviously there was a lot of development going on. It was important to document what was there and to control modifications and, and know what had been done. So a big, a big learning exercise. In terms of, of programming, the key team was, was led by David Kaminer and the other people at the top. That there, there wasn't um, a systems and programming split as perhaps there is more these days. A lot of it was, how could we understand the process and what was being done? Um, flow charting it, that's flow charting at a high level to decide how to split it into individual jobs and then flow charting within the, the program. And they developed a whole lot of discipline and standards for this. The, the, it was the machine, so machine time was was of the essence. They they developed quite early um, a system so that it wasn't just machine code. You you could have relative addressing and subroutines so that when when a program was loaded, it could be relocated. But the essence for everything was was desk checking before it ever got between uh, before it ever got near a computer. So all, all the flow charts were checked by a different person to the person who'd done it. The, the code was checked and then test data for every program was produced. And this test data was expected to test all, all the fault conditions and that would be desk checked. So someone would sit with the program, slowly going through it with the test data and eventually, um, you get to run it through the machine. Um, 
it was the critical resource. So a whole whole lot of that stuff, which is just taken for granted these days, was effectively being invented. And op operations, which doesn't happen so much these days, I suppose, but controlling data, punching and verifying it, um, developing paper tape punches and then reading it back, punching a second copy. The offline work, assemb assembling work, making sure that the correct program data was there, instructions and everything. Um, security of data, checking the printed output and making sure that that, that was of, of the right sort of quality, that, that characters hadn't gone missing. And then logging what was going on on the machine so that if a, a program halted, um, collecting all the evidence and, and, and doing what was necessary. And feeding back to the programmers and engineers that the whole thing was a team effort um, again. And, and deadlines were, were there to be met. Once, once the payroll started running, um, they, ne they never failed to be delivered on time. And then there was a whole issue of maintenance. Um, if, if you've got valve machines, they don't always like being switched on and off. Um, it would be switched on every day. The engineers would, would test the thing before handing it over. There were modifications to be fitted in. A lot of mechanical equipment, card readers and, and the uh, tabulator printers learning techniques for fault finding. Um, engineers who worked on LEO-1 will say that they, they spent just so much of their time looking into oscilloscopes. They were checking on valves and, and again, keep, keeping records, documenting the, the faults and feeding back. So if, if we look at it a bit pictorially, we can see that lions would have decided what their requirements were, which then by all, all the four groups we've looked at would, would need to work together. And then once the thing became operational, um, again, that, that would be fed back into engineers, learning for the operators and programming. It, this, this is all stuff that, that uh, is taken for granted these days. Now, while Lions were doing this, 200 miles up the M1, as they say these days. Um, the other development is, is the Manchester development where Baby was um, first worked in, in 1948. It, it wasn't a, a machine in the, sense, in the same sense as Ed, Ed Sacken, which was designed to provide a service for Cambridge or, or, or Leo. It was a proof of concept, but pretty quickly, Manchester University, in a collaboration with Ferranti and the government, um, started getting going because these these machines were needed uh, really for scientific and and uh, military type use. And there was a big um, contract, as you can see there. Ferranti paid were paid a large sum of money for about five years. And in 1952, they started selling and installing the Ferranti Mark I and Mark I stars. Um, and we can see that, that, that the real market driver for computers at that stage was, was defense. And you can see some examples here. This, this stuff has come from a presentation that Simon Lavington gave both in Manchester and and in London. And here you can see the on, on the left, all the various Mark Ones and Mark One stars that were built. And you can see the sort of organizations they went to. And at, um, at an event in Manchester, um, I met someone who'd, who'd produced, there was a report produced by the, um, the people at Fort Halstead about programming the Mark I. And on the right hand side is, is, is a copy of the distribution list of that. And it, it, it does in fact go to 
it went to Cambridge, the Cavendish Laboratory and so on, and, and some other universities. But, but basically it was all the uh, military and industrial, the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research and so on. Um, so that, that big effort was being done on, on the scientific side. And if we look at what else was happening um, just to summarize, you, you can see the various developments that the, the Manchester development came up to 1948. By 1951, the, the little orange diamond shows when machines were first sold that, that for, sorry, Ferranti started selling machines in 1951. Um, On the other, the other development was at NPL, um, which started off with the Ace and then the Deuce, and then in 1955, English Electric started selling machines. The, the Leo machine in the centre there had evolved through Cambridge and became operational in 1951, but the first machines weren't sold until 1957. Okay, uh, and you can see some of the other developments that were going on. So if we go back to, to Lyons, some of the applications they were looking at, they, they'd started a payroll pilot early, early on. Um, an important job was, was tea shops. They, they had hundreds of tea shops who, who needed restocking every day and that they needed to look at try, trying to make this more effective. And, and David Kaminer and others spent a long time looking at, at tea shops and what the manageresses ordered and worked out that, that each, each shop normally had a fairly standard order. So you don't need to put that in all the time. Why not just put in the exceptions? and it needed to be done quickly. Um, and we'll come back to it. I've got a bit, a bit of a film here uh, that we'll look at. Science, besides payroll, require their Leo to do several other routine clinical jobs. A job done every afternoon concerns deliveries to their 150 tea shops in London. There are hundreds of items of food, bakery goods of all kinds, Kitchen goods in a wide variety, for the breakfast, lunch, tea and supper trade, and for take-home sales. All these, in a varying quantity each day, are delivered to a precise timetable to the tea shops. Understocking leads to lost sales, but with food, overstocking soon becomes intolerably wasteful. Each manageress has a standing order depending on the day of the week. After lunch each day, she considers her stock, weighs up local conditions, and decides what variations, up or down, she will make to her order. She speaks by telephone to head office, where her variations are taken down directly onto cards. There is no written record. What the girl hears, she punches. At the same time, a short paper tape puts in last-minute management decisions, such as occur with changes in the weather. Thus is flexibility provided. Again, the program is fed first, laying down the sequence for the multiplicity of calculations Leo will perform. Next, the standing orders and the telephone revisions, tea shop by tea shop, are fed in, with the overriding variations on the paper tape. Immediately, packing notes begin to print out, ten shops at a time. At the same time, charges to tea shops and sales statistics are being recorded. After further electronic processing, these cards provide the statistics for the use of the management. By means of discriminants built into the program, Leo will examine all statistics, but only print the ones that require action. Managers are, in this way, given precise up-to-the-minute information, enabling decisions to be more closely related to trading conditions.
The packing notes, which were printed by Leo tin to a sheet, are separated. Yellow tin. Clipped to a packer's board and sent to the dispatch. Subtotals of the different items have been worked out for bulk movement to the several loading bays. Although the last revision is not telephoned until 3.30, by 4.30, Leo has printed for 150 tea shops and 40,000 items exactly what is wanted at each tea shop in the right order for the different loading bays. They are also in the right order for the carman's calls, so that the goods at the front of the lorry can be delivered last, and the first call is just inside the doors. These are only a few examples of the wide range of work undertaken by Leo. So that, that's quite interesting, really. This is 1954 with effectively online data collection. I mean, it wasn't going in through a screen, but it was going straight onto, onto punch cards. Um, dealing with stuff by exception. And, and all, all this was done on a machine with uh, 2,000 words of memory, no backing store, no magnetic tape or drums. Um, and so the jo jobs went on, um, but also in 1950, what, what, once Leo started operation, word, word got out that there was this machine. So they started doing some bureau work and some, some of it was scientific. So there were arm, army range tables that they did some stuff on for de Havilland's, which could have been Blue Streak or something like that. The, the Met Office people did, did their very first work on, on Leo, just, just to prove the method before they then went on to use the Ferranti Mark I um, in the way that the, the, the Met Office has always used the most powerful computer. But, but they did start off on Leo I. They, they produced the new tax tables for the government they did a job for British Rail, which at that time had five and a half thousand stations. Um, and as a common carrier, you, you could take um, you could take a parcel to any station and have it shipped to any other station. So they needed to know what the distance was between that station and any other station. And that that went on and took months and months. Um, to run, but but would have taken hundreds of people years to do manually. And they started doing work for Ford's, um, doing Ford's payroll. Um, and as you can imagine, it was it was beginning to fill up. Oh, sorry. Uh, wrong one. Right. So it was it was clear that that. Uh, with other people using it, that they, they, they then was saying, well, could you make one for us? And, and the long and the short of it is that in 1954, Pinkerton produced um, the ideas for, for Leo II. So one, one of the things they did was to, to interleave the, the store, which meant they could use shorter delay lines and they could have a, uh, a store that was four times faster than previously. Um, without making major changes to the processor. So the, the processor wouldn't be waiting for the, for the store as it had done. More registers um, and a 19-bit word instead of 17 bits. And um, it catered for more advanced peripherals, drums, magnetic tapes, and, and alphabetic printers, and, and dealing with alphabetic characters. And, in, and the result of that was that they, they formed a company called Leo Computers Limited. And drum, drums would allow much larger programs that the, the, the main memory was still the same size. Uh, magnetic tapes, and you can see them on, at the top there on the right, came from Decca. The drums came from Ferranti. Uh, Samastronic printers, which were an amazing device, um, but were quite clever because you could print pay slips and reports in, in parallel. Um, and again, more, more development on, on the programming side, there were standard routines to put the program on the drum and, and something which had started on Leo One, which were restart facilities. So that 
the idea was that you, you wouldn't do more than 15 or 20 minutes work without the ability to, to restart and, and not lose previous work. So a job would be split into perhaps 20 what were called restart groups. So that if, if for any reason it, it failed, you just went back to a known point and continued. And while this was going on, they were building up a, a maintenance and spares and so on. And then the work, work commenced on a Mark Sense document reader. So if, if we look at Leo 2, they started going to big companies, Wills Tobacco, that, well, the first machine were, was for Lions in, in a different building, not Cadby Hall, but an adjacent building. Um, Ford Motor Company had, had two machines, including a big machine at Dagenham. The last, last four machines had core store. Um, so the, the, the main memory was effectively four times larger than, than uh, previously. And the bureau where I worked, um, two, five, had eight magnetic tapes, two printers, you can see there, drums. And here are some pictures. Um, the bottom right is where I spent my first two years at work or two and a half years. Uh, the other pictures are of the Leo 2 at, uh, at Lyons. Here we have other machines. The machine at British Oxygen was was for a job that that in the end wasn't wasn't required and, and the machine came back and, and was a second machine in the bureau. By the by the end of the the 50s, new technologies were coming along, uh, transistors and so on. So that Pinkerton and his team um, and it, it wasn't just an engineering thing. Uh, you, you'll see at the bottom, there's a chap called John Gosden, who, who was uh, one, of, one of the programmers. And, and they looked at what was required to, to put together a machine um, using a lot of these new technologies. And then the new machine, which became Leo 3, um, was a parallel machine uh, as opposed to the serial uh, Leo 1 and 2. So it was transistorized. Um, the instructions were microprogrammed and they, they were diode matrix microprograms. Um, it supported multi-programming. So there was store, store protection, uh, interrupts, and, and the device controllers were intelligent. So the, the, the central processor wasn't used for input output. It just initiated the input output told the controller to get on with it and the controller would deal with the device and would call access to store. And all it had to do was, was notify at the end of the transfer that it was finished. And there were a lot of special data handling instructions that were microprogrammed so that the machine could work directly in decimal or sterling um, without needing to do conversions. All this needed an operating system to handle resources and and sharing um, sharing between the various programs, there was an assembler language called Intercode, which was a numeric language um, that was quite similar to the, to the machine language, but had a lot of facilities, including uh, facilities for programmers to to test. But th there was then a high level language developed called Clio, Clear Language for Expressing Orders, that, that was compiled into Intercode and then further translated. And that, that language um, was, was quite clever. It was, it was block structured like Algol, but it had data definitions like a bit more like COBOL, but it also had a, a facility which was in, in DBase, which said, keep copying records forward until the one I'm interested in. So it, it removed from the programmer a lot of the, it, they didn't have to say, read the next record, am I interested in this one, write it forward. It, it really um, reduced work like that. And 
program suites were split up in, instead of as as in Leo one, you'd be reading data for one man while you were doing the pay of a previous one and printing another one that the, they were split up in, into the sort of jobs that we'd expect to see today, data vet, sort the data, do the main run and print the results. And a lot more people brought it. A lot of the big blue chip companies, um, Dunlops, well, you can see the list at the top there. For, Fords were going to buy one, um, but the Americans took full control and the conversation was along the lines of, you, you don't buy your computers from Joe the Bakers. Um, so machine 12, which I think would have been Ford's, uh, became the prototype for the 326 faster machine. But you can see there that some big companies, Shell Max and BP had four machines. At that time, they had a, a, a joint operation selling um, on the retail side. Um, quite a lot of public sector, local government, um, overseas. Uh, in fact, the first machine went to South Africa, to the uh, to the bureau there. So the person who commissioned that had an exciting time with the first machine out of the factory. And then further machines went to Australia and into the East European market. But the largest single customer was what was the, the GPO who, who at that stage ran the telephones as well as the national savings and uh, post offices and so on. And all, all telephone bills in the country between 1960, I think between 66 and 81 were produced on, on Leo computers. Uh, the original order was was absolutely massive. There were three variants that the basic machine, the standard machine, um, had a 13 and a half microsecond store, and then the faster machines basically had faster stores and faster processes to go with them. Uh, there's another little bit of film. You'll, you'll see under companies, there was a company called Durlackers who was stock, stock jobbers in the, in the in the city, jo jobbers would buy shares from brokers and sell to brokers, and all the settlement had to be done overnight. And we did a bureau job on Leo 2 for that, and then they bought their own machine. And there's a little bit of film here that must have been made, I would think, by some of the operators. It's a silent film and it's converted from eight millimeter. So let's go. It's, it's really showing some of the operations going on. So you've got people working offline. You can see at the back there's an Analex printer. The tape decks came from Ampex. These are these are TM4 model. There's a coupling coupling system. Paper tape readers came from Elliot's thousand characters per second. And the operator put commands in through through uh, switches on, on the control desk. And there was a, there was a typewriter that that uh, produced a type log. It was an IBM typewriter and it had a red and red and black ribbon so that uh, alarms to if, if, it, if you needed to draw attention for the operator. Um, it would come out in red, not normal comments in, in black.
very important to have the the bin that that paper tape was going into to have it earthed. Um, I saw one once that wasn't earthed and in the middle of doing that that there was a, an enormous spark that jumped across. That's a printed circuit board, not, uh, not that clear. Oh, one of the cabinets and just showing the back of some of the uh, the racks engineers control panel you could run the machine at slow speed which was useful for the engineers um, and you could run at slow micro speed so you, you could single step through micro programs as well So that's that. So basically, um, some pretty big systems that the post office machines had about 12 decks and several printers on them. Um, we'll see some pictures later. Um, the, the Mark Sense readers that we had called the lector, that there was also an automatic version, uh, an online version that, that would read documents. So Lyons had what was effectively a closed loop paper system. So the roundsman went round and took orders and, and Mark, Mark Sense the documents that were then read by the auto lector at, uh, at, at quite a rate. Uh, and then the, the a, a mag tape was produced that was taken to an off offline ranked Xeronic printer that produced new paper forms for the roundsman. Um, and that worked quite well. And the dockyards you use them similarly. There, there were four, four naval dockyards then. Um, Richard Shops used an er early form of, of stock control. Um, reading Kimball tags, which, which were tear off tickets that, that were on the on the garment and had little holes in them that were read mechanically. Um, they did some because it was the GPO, they could get the telephone lines. Uh, at one time, all, all postal orders went back to Chesterfield and, and they had some some readers that, that we got from Crossfield that actually were reading online. In, into one of the um, GPO machines in Charles House in London. And, and they could pocket select as well. So, so you would read the document and it, if it was a good one, it, it would be selected. You can imagine that, that with a lot of machines, there was a need for, for training people, whether they were engineers or, or programmers. Um, and as I said before, a, a lot of facilities for engineers. And here are some pictures. Um, again, the, the ones at the top are the bureau in, in Hartree House at Queensway, the first machine, and some other ones. The, the machine, the bottom right, is quite interesting. It, it was installed in Manchester Town Hall, and you may see at the right hand side, um, there's a pillar there, um, effectively with gargoyles on it. And they were visited by, uh, they had a visit from Commander Grace Hopper 
once the the lady who, the, who uh, produced Cobol in the United States, and uh, she was quite taken with the uh, with the computer room. And these are some of the 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 machine at the top left was was for doing premium bonds at Lytham St Anne's, um, and you can see some other machines. The bottom left is an uptime card reader, and that would read read cards, 40 column cards at, four, at 2000 a minute. And in, in between the, the left hand hopper there and the middle hopper there, the machine would read it, decide whether it, it was a good card or not. And if it was a good card, it would pull across a gate so that the card would be accepted into the middle hopper. So again, sort of a sort of only a few milliseconds allowed there to, so some clever programming involved. Um, so after after 1967, um, we were English Electric by then, and and the new machine was was System Four. So the the company needed to look after people's in, investment, so that there was a Clio compiler on System Four, known as the Clio Bridge. Um, and later than that, towards the end of the, the 70s, the, the GPO Leo machines that had been in some of them then for about 14 years and were already using 2,900 peripherals um, were, were running out. So um, Tony Morgan had the idea because ICL had produced what were called DME machines, direct machine environment, that the 2960 had, had already been um, re-microprogrammed to run system four and 1900. And because Leo was microprogrammed, they, they were able to take the microprograms for Leo and they and, and the Scottish Development Center, they, they produced that. Um, and Tony Morgan took the the test programs up there and and within a relatively short time they got the got the machine working um, on time and in budget so if if we go back and look and look at some of the things we might remember that the whole thing was user driven into innovation it, it wasn't an electronics company saying here's some stuff let's sell it um, Sim Simmons, who, who was a giant of his of his time, was looking at, at how it could benefit the business. And that group of people that were there turned all that innovation in, into working systems, st stuff that hadn't been done before. Um, early applications, large scale payrolls, um, on, on fairly primitive machines, really. I think we could call T shops online data collection. Um, using Lecter, that was early. Microprogramming and, and complex instructions. That there were instructions on, on Leo 3 to facilitate the sorting process so that, that it used string sorts so that. The first pass of a sort would be to to take groups of records um, and sort them in, into strings. Um, and if it was a four tape sort, then then you'd have an equal number of of strings. If it was a three tape sort, they, they'd be split into a, a Fibonacci uh, split. And then the rest of the sort was really just merging them together. And there was an instruction that would say merge two strings and put them in a in a third place so and similarly there was an edit instruction that that could build up lines of print it it, it could select data from from different places if necessary convert it from from a decimal number to an alpha character it could insert spaces and and, and pound signs and so on and it it could use multi radix computing which in the commercial world was required i mean this was before decimalization so that um the machines had a, a, a 10 character and an 11 character on 
as, as a physical character so that you could print 10 pence and 11 pence in, in one, uh, one position. I talked about the, the intelligent imp input output and the, the operating system and, and a very big order with it. But the key, the key thing was, was the people. They, as you can see, they, they, they got people from all sorts of background and education that they weren't all mathematicians. They weren't all necessarily graduates. There, there were people there with geography degrees and history degrees as, as well as the mathematicians and so on. There, there wasn't an, an aptitude test that was really looking to see whether people would actually perform in practice. And that, that led to really the whole Leo way of, of being the best and, and getting it right and, and, and working as a team. Um, and, and people worked all sorts of hours and, and uh, did goodness knows what to make sure that things happened. And some of the people that came out of Leo, you, you've probably heard of Peter Herman, who worked on, on Leo One and is still with us. He, he left and went to Dunlop and from Dunlop, he went to develop the, the reservation system for BOAC and ended up on the main board of BOAC. Frank Land, who was a, an early programmer and became a consultant. Um, I use the term consultant, which was used in Leo. We didn't have salesmen because the, the person working with the customer wasn't there just, just to sell some hardware, he was working with the customer to ensure that um, what was sold would, would do the job and, and benefit the customer. So they, they had a much, much broader brief. And Frank, Frank left, and as you can see, was the first professor of information systems. John Ayres went on to Imperial and then the NCC, John Gosden, Went, went to the States, um, Tim Holly with, with Data Skill and then Camelot, Nini Nidi, who was very closely involved with the development of, of Clio and, and uh, or in, initiating it and selling to the post office, uh, ended up as a director of ICL, uh, whereas other people went on. Mike Jackson, re, re, uh, completely reorganized the way that Freeman's mail order worked with, with, by using the machine. Ralph Land, who is again still with us, the, the Lands are, are both in their 90s. Uh, Ralph is, is Frank's twin brother, and he did a lot of work in the East European market, starting, starting with Leo and then, then going on later with, with, with System 4. And David Kaminer, of course, who was the person who, who drove, who drove all the, the initial programming work and really in, enforced the, the discipline that ensured that stuff worked and, and was done the right way. Um, eventually went on and, and at the end of his career was project manager for a vast, um, ICL project in, in the European Commission in Brussels. So there's a legacy. Um, clever people, equipment that, that hadn't been put together in that way before. But today, everybody uses computers. What, what we're using now, what people use every day, what people take for granted that the non-mathematic and scientific stuff, a lot of it came from, from Leo um, and it's just taken for granted now. Um, now the legacy, another thing that's being done is to preserve the legacy. Now, David Holdsworth, who, who's here today, um, is, is responsible for, he, he'd done some work on KDF9 sort of software archaeology and and wanted to see if that was transferable so we 
we photo we we got hold of some listings of the Leo software for the language translator and the operating system, and photographed the sheets, which were then down downloaded by people who effectively data prep them. So one person would would key in uh, a sheet of code, and someone else would key it in again and check it. And out of that, and, and David's written uh, extensively in the Resurrection ma magazine, um, we now have the Intercode translator that works, um, that translated itself in, in, into native code and, and the master routine. And it is possible to run the Intercode translator under the master routine and to run other programs under the master routine. Um, Quite, quite a remarkable uh, exercise. And the other thing that's being done um, is the National Lottery Heritage Fund. We, to get, together with the Centre for Computing History in Cambridge, put together a project and went, went to the National Lottery because it, it's not just old railway engines or pumping houses and so on that, that are significant in, in the national heritage. Leo is, is unique in, in, the, in its development of commercial computing. So the, a, a project was put together and was initially funded with a, 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 about an 18 month um, pilot project um, which was to be followed up by um, the main implementation project. And altogether, the, the project is for four years and involves, as you can see, about 370 grand. And what's being done is to collect together artifacts to, to know where stuff is, that there is a big collection of documents in Manchester. There's, there's quite a lot of stuff at Warwick but there are also, <coughs> excuse me, there are also items that, that uh, pieces of hardware and, and documents that people are coming out all the time that people have got in their lofts or garages or wherever. Um, quite a lot of that's being scanned. But in, in the second part, there are two key projects. One is um, a virtual reality recreation of, of, of Leo One. So, Normally you think of, of virtual reality, of, of having something clapped on your head. And I think that that will be available, but, but the key thing is that it will be available on, on for example, a Windows machine or an iPad. Um, and this is being recreated um, from photographs. And what, what started as a few photographs is, is now 106 photographs that were taken in the computer room of Leo, uh, of, of Leo One over, over a period of years. So there's some, some timeline um, and you can see different developments, but what it's enabled them to do is, is to make accurate, accurate measurements so that what, what will be produced will be um, effectively a, a virtual Leo One that you can walk around and if, if, if you touch things or want to inquire on things, then it will bring up further information. So it, it won't be just to walk around and look at stuff. It, it, will, it will be used as a, a, a method of gaining access. And as you can see, it, it brings together Lions products and, and the technology. And, and finally, um, or nearly finally, the, there are several books that have been written. The, the one on the left, uh, User Driven Innovation, written by Kamina, John Ayres, Peter Herman and Frank Land. Um, and there's, there's a chapter in there about Freemans as well. <clears throat> the first book that came out was, was written by Peter Bird, who was the computer manager at Lions. Um, He's written two books, one about Lions itself, but one, one about Leo, and that's a very comprehensive book still available. Georgina Ferry, who's a well-known um, journalist, 
wrote a the book on on the top right there which, which is um a sort of fairly rigorous book and then there are things like leo remembered which, which the society produced as uh, a collection of anecdotes in informal anecdotes from people so that's that brings us to the end i think i've talked about why why a, a business computer was needed and and where it fitted in um what happened at the beginning the lessons learned and and where we've got to and it, it may be a bit cheesy but we actually do have a, a guinness uh a guinness certificate that records uh lions as the the first business computer in the world so thank you very much That was excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I can see applause flattering across my screen. Very well deserved. John, that was fascinating, not the least putting into context people I've met over 50 years nearly in IT, but didn't really know where they fitted in. So apart from that, that's been really, really nice. Thank you very much indeed. And um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. Uh, and um, I'd like to give as much time as possible to that. So I'm going to hand back to Roger, who will be in charge of the rest of the session. But once more, thank you for a brilliant talk. Very informative, fascinating, and certainly held the attention of the audience and lots of, of contributory chat. It's been great. Thank you. I, th I think I kept it down to an hour as well. <laughs> Which is very, much. very good. Thank you again <laughs> for that too. <laughs> Can you go through the chat list, please? Uh, um, Roger, are you going to pick up? Go through the chat list and answer the questions. Uh, ro Roger, Roger Johnson will manage that process as uh, okay. host. It uh, has to be done from there. I'm, he's trying <coughs> to say something, but he's showing us mute at the moment. Yes, he's I, right. Sorry, I. Oh, there you go. All oh, right, over to you, Roger. Thank you. Okay. Um, there are uh, lots of comments rather than questions, um, but going first of all to to, to the questions, um, th there's a question from um, John Wilcock uh, asking why did Leo sell out to or, or merge with uh, merged with others to form uh, English electric uh, Leo Marconi uh, and secondly he asks which machine was the first to do um, multi-programming um, why the merger what what was the driver John I, I think it was the scale of, of of what was required for the GPO order and, and the investment that was, was was required, and I think Lyons decided at, at that point that that um, the Lyons management themselves had had made a decision that that this wasn't in their long term plan. I think so. They, they, they it it was sort of allegedly a merger. But, but the English electric people came in and took over. It was quite a surprise to the lines uh, to the Leo management, um, and 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 Lions um, moved into a back seat. So that that was English electric Leo. Marconi came in because I think they'd they'd been links with Marconi, and it was Marconi's computer side, and also that they were getting together with. RCA in the States, which had been Marconi America. Um, and then Elliot's commercial side was swept in, at which point they just called it English Electric Computers. But I, I think it was that, that Lions had decided that uh, it had all, all been quite good, but, but they didn't see themselves as, as uh, being computer manufacturers in the long term. John, uh, Lions also sold their last share in the company. Yes. Thank you, Peter. Um, 
can I ask who were Lion's main competitors? It was presumably BTM and the American companies. Um, yes, I th I th several people left Leo and went to work for Honeywell. So Honeywell were coming into the country and I think selling, they had a machine called the 200 that, that, that was very much like a 1401, I think. Um, and I know that Ford, Ford's at Averley, who'd had a Leo 2 bought a 1401. So um, the Americans started coming in. Um, and, and when Leo, Leo was phasing out, the, they did do some work on a machine called Leo 4, but, but that, that was killed when English Electric took over. And, and the decision was made to go with, with RCA and System 4. Okay. Um, the, could you just say a little more about Lennart's notebook, which is being transcribed? There's a question about that project. Um, they, they were, I think they were transcribed for the, um, for the EDSAC project. Um, and, and, and was scanned. And I think we, we've now got them at Cambridge where they'll be scanned again in, at, at a higher resolution. I think that's right, Peter, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, Lisa's with us, so she could, and Jude. Yes. The, the, I, I should say that, that also here are um, Peter Byford, who's chairman of the Leo Society, um, Lisa from, the centre in Cambridge and Jude, who, who is the archivist employed there. So in, in, in some of the, if, if I ask Peter or, or them to to uh, to yeah. reply, if that's all right. Yeah. Do you, do you want to talk about that? Pardon? Ro Roger, L L Lisa's now saying. To... Yes, I, I heard she, she was asking Jude, I think. I don't know if Jude, if Jude is still with us, but if not, I'll, I'll say um, we're, we're transcribing um, all of the Lennox notebooks um, currently and we'll make them available online um, in a way that means that you can see each page of the notebook in its original form and then the transcription next to it side by side. Um, they're a fascinating resource um, and we have volunteers working on the transcriptions um, at the moment. Um, they'll be really useful once they go online. I saw a comment go by that uh, that those notes have been of great use in the EDSAC rebuild. I don't know whether anybody from the EDSAC rebuild project would like to comment on that. <laughs> so uh, I, they I may be I muted, her, but wasn't available this afternoon. No, I think that was true. <laughs> Okay, I just wondered if, if there was somebody on the in the meeting who, who'd been involved with that. A recent um, comment said they were invaluable to them. Yes. Um, most of the other comments, of which there are many, uh, are comments rather than questions, John. Um, right. I think if there are any last final questions, uh, let me scroll down uh, or. or um, don't see any more questions um, about the multi-programming question. Uh, yes, we did. I did ask the question. Um, <coughs> what, Leo, w uh, were any of the Leo machines multi-programming machines? Yes, Leo, Leo three was right. Well, all I can say was when I joined English Electric, they were claiming that KDF9 was the first machine to do multi-programming and there were four different programs running con concurrently. Are you saying now that it was, it was Leo rather than English Electric that did this? Um, yeah. Well, they, they both did it. I mean, KDF9 could run four programs, I think. Leo could run 13 if, if, if you could get that many in. Um, Leo was developed about 1961. I don't know when they started on KDF9. 
Um, I hope somebody can help us with that. I think KDF9 is slightly younger than Leo. Um, to what mm. extent uh, it was influenced by Leo, I really don't know. But the, the multiprogramming on KDF9 uh, is claimed to be one of the first where you've got memory, <coughs> memory translation so that there's a difference between the virtual address that the programmer sees and the hardware address that the memory sees. Whereas the, the Leo, Leo 3 is a real memory machine like an IBM 360. And in fact, the IBM 360 storage protection is very much the same as Leo 3. Thank you, David. I, th I think as as with lots of in in the way that that ICL's new range was was a sort of synthetic option, looking at what were all the good things and and could they be put together in 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 a good way. Um, I mean, someone's pointed um, out that um, Imperial College were looking at microprogramming in 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 a relay machine, and and Wilkes got the idea from him. So. It, it's not all this was invent, invented here. What, what it was, was, was using ideas like that. And Wilkes was working on, on microprogramming, but, but Leo came out, the, the Leo 3 came out as, as a machine um, that was microprogrammed. And it, in fact, that there, there were on, on the standard machine groups of, of, of instructions were in little things like little black briefcases so that some some instructions were optional. So float if you wanted floating point, um, you had more microprogram boxes plugged in and so on. Um, Plus the analytical engine was microprogrammed. Pardon? The analytical engine uh, <laughs> had microprogramming. Right, yes. Yes. Um, there's, there's a an, an question here, uh, um, John, from Toby Bryans, uh, whose uncle worked for Lyons uh, pre-Leo. Yes. Um, and is asking, uh, his, his uncle um, was, was uh, not uh, an enthusiast for <coughs> computerization. Um, it, to what extent did Leo encounter pushback? from uh, employees within uh, Lions uh, more, more generally? What was the sort of social impact within the organization of, of Leo One? I honestly don't know, before my time. <laughs> I, I got the impression that there wasn't much at all. And there was, I mean, nobody was actually sacked, it was made redundant for um, Leo coming in. I think uh, they just expanded things. So, what well, I didn't, um, all the people I've spoken to suggest there was no real um, obvious um, complaints about Leo and Jobs. I think the. Just say though that um, I've just been recently, as part of the project, been looking at newspaper articles from um, around the time, the early to mid 50s, and there was a public pushback. Um, just the concept of so-called giant brains, which is what they were often called at the time, um, taking over Clark's jobs. Um, it was definitely um, a public perception that there would be jobs lost, although in the event there really wasn't. Um, but that certainly was um, a public perception early on in the Leo story. I think, I think I've picked up a bit that there was some pushback from managers who, but, but I don't know whether this was a computer thing or not, who, who were, being, it was being suggested that that they would be given exceptions to follow up, which, which I think some of them possibly felt threatened by, because the computer, instead of just throwing everything at them and letting them be in control of, of what they did, that mm. the, 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 the systems were saying, perhaps this area needs looking at, and, and I suspect there was some pushback from some managers there feeling that they were being emasculated. No? Lions generally were pretty good with their staff. Yes. Hello, hello about multi-programming. Alan, do you want to... Oh, sir? 
Yes. Do you want to make a comment? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I think on multi-programming we need to go back a lot, a lot earlier in, into the Cambridge days and the Cambridge Math Lab sen seminars. Uh, Pinkerton was in one of the Cambridge people who were involved, and Franti were also heavily involved with uh, developments coming out of Cambridge. But the generalised approach to multi-programming or running multiple jobs was, um, well, it evolved. And um, Leo, in Leo, it was very much to sort of get um, peripherals running in parallel with uh, doing a bit of the computing. The generalized approach to multi-programming was developed by Ferranti. And um, the ideas in that were presented at the Maths Lab sen seminar and John Gosden picked them up and rushed back to Leo and sort of tried to sort of put that into the context. But the basic mechanisms to do with hardware protection and so on for several jobs running in parallel were, had to be put, put re, more or less retrofitted onto the hardware design, unless you'd actually start out with that as the first, in the first place. So there's a bit of history there. I can, I can sort of tell you a lot more about that, but um, let's see what others say. Are there any other contributions that anyone wants to make on, on, on multi-programming? Uh, okay. Uh, 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 I, I, I can add on multi-programming that I have looked inside the KDF line director, part of which I actually wrote, and inside the Leo master program, and you can see that the, um, the KDF line model, well, to my eyes, seems far better structured, and in fact has got internal multi-programming within it. Thank you, David. Uh, Perhaps uh, we might, uh, there's one more question. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's a tongue in cheek question, but um, uh, Alan O'Donoghue asked whether Frank and Ralph were identical twins. They are. Ah, they are. <laughs> yes. That's an easily answered question. Thank you. Um, I, I, I've been through, I hope, uh, all of the uh, questions that came in. There are lots of comments which we will be captured um, and, and uh, I, I think will be available to, to John. Um, the meeting's been recorded and so we will be putting that up uh, onto um, Facebook in the normal way, sorry, onto YouTube in the normal way uh, within uh, a, a week or two. Um, and I think at that point, uh, we'll close again thanking John Danes very much for a fascinating afternoon and uh, we achieved a total attendance, the peak attendance, of 155, which uh, is far more than we, we, it's more than last time and far more obviously than we have been able to have face to face. So John, thank you for a wonderful afternoon and uh, on behalf of everybody, uh, thank you for all that work and we wish uh, Leo Computers Society well uh, in promoting the history, uh, the public knowledge uh, of the history of Leo Computers. Thank you very much indeed. Right. Well, thank you as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.